Ah, yes, looking at all these clues, it was definitely Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the study. Well, hello there. Today, I want to talk to you about crafting a mystery in a fantasy world. This topic was suggested by one of the people in my Discord server. If you would like to suggest topics and connect with other world builders, join my Discord server, link down below. Okay, let's crack on. I'm going to talk about the design of a mystery by analyzing Jim Butcher's novel Stormfront. If you have not yet read Stormfront, this is your one and only spoiler warning. I am going to spoil the whole thing. Okay, let's crack on. The most important question in a mystery is who has agency? Generally speaking, it is the bad guys who have agency, the non-player characters or the villainous characters in a book. The good guys or the player characters are seeking to play catch up. I speak about player characters and protagonists interchangeably in this because the only difference between crafting for a role playing game and crafting for a novel in terms of a mystery is how many elements of redundancy you put in. Players will miss everything, absolutely everything. So if you're crafting for a role-playing game, here's my advice. Put in three places where the players can get the same clue. That way they have three opportunities before you have to hit them with a Captain Obvious bat. So back to Stormfront. In Stormfront, our main villain is called Victor Seltz. He has turned to dark wizardry and he is creating a drug called Three Eye by using magic. This drug opens up the third eye in anybody who takes it, basically exposing unprepared mortals to dire magic. Victor has also started using magic to dispose of his enemies. He generates the power he needs to kill people by using the summer storms of Chicago, the lightning strikes, to use sympathetic magic as below, so above with voodoo dolls, in essence, to rip the heart out of his enemies. Victor's primary goal in all of this is to displace mob boss Johnny Marcone and to become a dominant force on the street. It's a fairly simple motivation. There are more complexities about it, but it comes later. Victor is assisted by two henchmen, the Beckett's, Mr. and Mrs. Be Beckett. Their child was killed in a drive-by shooting by accident by a stray bullet fired potentially from Johnny Marcone's gun, the current mob boss of Chicago. And the Beckett's are seeking revenge. Because their child died, you have a great deal of sympathy for their motivations. Victor Sells is also married. He is married to Monica Sells. Now, Monica is one of our primary means of getting Harry Dresden involved because Monica wants to stop Victor before he can harm their children. Now we understand who our movers are on the evil side. To craft a mystery from these facts is you need a way to get the protagonist involved and slowly spin out all the events that will lead them to the conclusion of the mystery. So we know what the conclusion is. We know that Victor Sells is a murderer who is manufacturing a drug called 3 Eye. And now that we know what the core of our mystery is, we need to think about how we get our investigator involved. Our investigator in this case is a man who is very protective towards others, especially women. And he is a wizard. He is listed in the phone book as a wizard. We also know that he's kind of broke at the moment, so he's in need of money. So that's another motivational factor. And we will learn later that he is under judgment by the White Council of Wizard. The sword of Damocles hangs over his head. And if he is accused of using black magic again, he will be summarily executed. So those are all our hooks into the character of Harry Dresden. The first hook that Jim Butcher sent into him was simple transactional. Monica Sells phoned Harry Dresden right in the opening scene of the book and asked for help. Harry agreed to meet with her because he's broke 
and it's a woman who's asking for help. Both of these things speak to two of his motivations. From there, we were then introduced to Karen Murphy, who is a lieutenant with a cops. Now, the cops in the Dresden verse have got a special unit called the Spook Squad, and this squad of cops are sent for whenever there is something weird that happens. Now, there has been a weird murder. Two people have been found with their hearts ripped out. These two people are Jennifer Stanton and Tommy Tom. These are our first victims. Now, what Harry doesn't know yet is that this heart being ripped out is part of the investigation that he is on, but he is introduced to it as a secondary investigation. But because he is on retainer to the cops, and of course they pay him, he goes to the investigation to go check it out. This gives us our first murder scene, which is a lot like a crime scene in a TV series. It is a place of infinite clues. So what we need to decide is at each of these scenes, each of these points of gathering evidence, is how, my, how many clues do we put in here. Into this first scene, the most important clue that Harry walks away with is that black magic was used to kill these people. This means that there's only a very small number of people capable of wielding this level of power in Chicago, one of which is Harry himself, which brings into play the Sword of Damocles. If the White Council pin these murders on him, he's dead. Regardless of who the murderer is, he's dead. So now he has three critical incentives to solve this mystery and fast. But you don't want to give the hero a linear path to solving the mystery. And that's where obstacles come in. The first obstacle enters as soon as Harry leaves that first crime scene. And that is in the shape of Johnny Marcone himself. Johnny Marcone tries to get Dresden to back off the case. But Dresden refuses because he doesn't like mob bosses and he goes on his merry way to meet Monica Sells. Now, Monica Sells is a potential source of information for Harry. In fact, she is the greatest source of information. But she's not going to reveal everything to him right now because she is frightened. So what she reveals to him is very limited. She just tells him about Victor's obsession with black magic and she tells him that Victor has disappeared and that she thinks he might have gone to their house by the lake. Later, she'll be able to provide more information when Harry knows to ask questions, but at this point, that's all she's going to volunteer. But that gives Harry another scene to investigate where he can find more clues. In the meantime, there are people in the city that he can talk to to determine whether they were involved in this black magic. As it happens... One of them is also the employer of one of the victims, Jennifer Staten, and that is the vampire, Bianca. He learns here that Jennifer's best friend was Linda Randall, and she might know something more. Somewhere in between all this, complication number two shows up, and that is when we're introduced to Morgan. Morgan is another wizard, like Harry, he's part of the White Council. But he thinks that Harry is basically a black wizard and he wants any excuse to take Harry's head if Harry so much as twitches in the direction of black magic. This makes Harry's investigation incredibly complex because if Morgan knows that he's investigating black magic, he could very easily misconstrue and then kill Harry as part of the judgment of the Sword of Damocles. So Harry is now both incentivized and his hands are semi-tied. There's only so much he can do. At the lakeside house, Harry finds a film in a canister, but he also does something else to find information, and that is he draws on existing contacts. So Harry has some existing contacts that can potentially help him in this investigation. And one of those is the dewdrop fairy Toot Toot. So he summons the dewdrop fairy and questions him about any events that took place here. And they bring back the information that pizza was delivered here by Pizza Express. When Harry phones Pizza Express, he finds out that other people have been asking about this. But he also finds out that the people inside the lake house had been having 
raunchy, raunchy, orgy level sex, and he knows that this can be used to generate energy for a magic ritual. Okay, remember Linda, who we found out about from Bianca? So he contacts her and finds out that she works for the Becketts. Remember, he doesn't know who the Becketts are at this point. He just, he meets them very briefly, but he doesn't know who they are. Linda, however, had hired a photographer to take photos of the orgy scene to use them as leverage against her employers. And it was this film that came into Harry's possession from the Lake House scene. In the meantime, Harry's also asked Monica for something that her husband owned so that he can use it to trace her husband, and her husband gave him the scorpion amulet. It's a dried scorpion amulet, which Harry put in his desk and ignored. That will come into play later. Harry then proceeds to use another one of his allies, Bob the Skull, and do some research into how this black magic could have been done, how these storms could have been evoked. In the meantime, our bad guys find out about Harry. Victor summons a demon to send after Harry, but this doesn't work out so well for him because Harry is a much more educated wizard than Victor himself. So he manages to send the demon back to Victor. They then send a guy with a sharp knife, not to cut Harry's throat, but to get a lock of his hair. This provides the final incentive for Harry. With his hair, they can kill him the next time there's a storm. Harry is now living on borrowed time. He goes to the cop station where he encounters a victim of the three-eyed drug and he realizes that these guys really do see with their eye open. And he starts to put the cases together, including that of Monica Sells, which especially solidifies when he learns Monica Sells was Jennifer Statton's sister. This, of course, opens the whole can of worms and he goes back to Monica and confronts her. She finally explains to him that, yes, she knows about her husband's activity, she needs him stopped, and she's really sorry that Harry's going to die. She knows what it means that her husband has a lock of his hair. Now a storm is building and Harry starts to panic. But he knows that this ritual is carried out at the lake house. So all he has to do is get back there and we can get to the climactic finale of the book, right? The confrontation. Not that simple. Remember the scorpion? Yes. Well, Murphy has been growing more and more suspicious of Harry's activities. And she goes to investigate in his office. She finds the scorpion. She activates it by getting stung by it. And it turns into a scorpion the size of a dog. And Harry has to run and go and help her against this thing. So now he's prevented from going to the final battle by having first to deal with this thing, another obstacle in his path. And he expends a lot of energy on killing the scorpion. So when he finally does set out for the lake house, he is exhausted and in no shape for this fight, making that final climactic conclusion all the more dire. In the end, he does win that final battle. And in fact, Morgan, who saw him fight, realized he didn't even once resort to black magic and so testified before the White Council and had the Sword of Damocles removed. So it was a very satisfying conclusion for Harry. But if you look at the board all around me now, you will see that to craft a mystery, we need the core of the plot, the scenes where our hero will get the pieces of information that he needs the reasons why our hero will go on this investigative journey, what is going to incentivize him along the way. We need some obstacles and red herrings for him. And we need some people that he can interact with that are specific to the mystery that will give him some information. And he needs some allies that he can use to do research and get information in general about what he's looking for. And all of these things breadcrumb him through the story and sometimes take him off track with red herrings and obstacles until he reaches the satisfying conclusion of the life and death struggle to overcome the grand finale of the mystery. 
I hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Just In Time Worlds. If you like this kind of deconstruction of a novel and its plot, let me know in the comments below and I might do a few more of these. And otherwise, I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.